over the last decades, but a lot of results are controversial in literature. So the management of early onset scoliosis is for sure very challenging and very long. So why would you consider surgery in early onset scoliosis patients? First, when you have a curve progression, despite an appropriate conservative treatment. Another case is what you have a big frontal imbalance or sometimes sagittal, which is altering daily activities of the child. Very often, you also have a cosmetic demand by the patient or the family or caregivers. And more and more, we also have patients coming with their parents and they're requesting surgery because they have found articles on Google on any other web thing. So the theoretical advantages of the surgery in early onset is to gain height because most of these kids lose height because of the deformity. You want to improve the pulmonary function and you want to improve the quality of life of these patients. So basically what you want to do is break the vicious circle of scoliosis on the development of the child. Because the, when the scoliosis gets worse, the sitting height decrease, the thoracic shape and volume is altered, which also have a consequence on the lung development. And then the result, you have the thoracic insufficiency syndrome responsible for hypotrophy. So we're gonna have tonight a great spine webinar with a high level faculty coming from Netherlands. We'll have Moyo Kreut and Rene Castellan. Then we'll have Muharrem Yazici, who is the current president of the SRS, talking about the growth-friendly surgical options. Then Sebastian Pesanti from Marseille will talk about the complications of surgery in these young patients. And Kariman Abelin from Lyon in France will talk about the conservative options. And then we'll finish with a conclusion, some take-home messages, and hopefully we'll have time to have a couple of questions and answers. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can see my screen now. Um, let's see how that works. Great. Um, can I get some? Feedback, is this uh, screen visible for anyone? Or is that not an option? You're, you're okay, Moyo. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Oh, no, I lost it again. Great, sorry. Hey, where is it? Um, you're good, Moyo. Yeah, but my, I, I, this, I see my own picture now and not the screen. Ah, here we are. Okay, no, shit. I take, no, shit. For some reason, my own picture gets in the way. Okay, I'll do it like this. Um, uh, and I hope I can get forward. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome. Uh, my name is Mario Kraut from uh, Utrecht, the Netherlands. And I'd like to present you the um, uh, presentation on trunk development and spinal growth. Uh, shit. No, that doesn't work. Shit. Let me see what's going on here. Uh, for some reason, I cannot move forward in the screen. Um, help. Mooi, om met je met je knopjes voor en achteruit te werken. Niet heb je al geprobeerd? Nee, dat heb ik geprobeerd. Alle knoppen, niks, geen enkel knopje werkt meer. Yeah. Great. Uh, let's just stop the screen now. Sorry. Um, let's see. I start again, show screen. Uh, 
Okay. Yes, uh, you see uh, you see my screen now. Yeah, I see him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now I, I can continue. Apparently there was some bug. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, you're probably going to see this uh, slide uh, a few more times during this uh, um, uh, meeting. Uh, we all know that the uh, volume of the lungs is uh, quadratic related to the length of the spine, and this is a very important. Uh, thing to consider. It means that in the life five years of growth, your the volume of your lungs uh, double in size. Uh, obviously, the uh, the volume of the lungs is not the only thing that is important. Also, this is a very well known uh, slide you will see probably uh, more, which indicates the development of the uh, alveoli in the lungs. Uh, the alveoli are the uh, the respiratory units, and uh, they proliferate. Uh, especially in the early phase of growth until about eight years old. After that age, there will be no more proliferation of the alveoli. So that's one of the reasons to uh, optimally uh, allow expansion of the lungs, especially in the early ages, because without this expansion, the alveoli cannot proliferate and you will have a lower amount of alveoli the rest of your life. So, if we talk um, about uh, a progressive scoliosis in a child, uh, which are the uh, threats uh, uh, to pulmonary function? Well, of course, it's the volume, as I showed you. If your spine is not growing or not gaining height, the volume will be low. But probably more important uh, is the function of the thoracic cage. The stiffness is a very important parameter. The number of alveoli, as I said, um, the resistance in the bronchial tree is uh, important. You can imagine that with a spine that is deviated from the midline and pushing against the bronchi, uh, it's very hard to breathe out. And then uh, the uh, diaphragm um, has to function properly. Oh no, now it is stuck again. Damn it. Uh, yes, um, Dr. Redding um, recently uh, gave us a nice uh, talk at the SRS uh, meeting about the interrelation between the lung volume, the lung function, but also the physical function of a patient. You can imagine that due to uh, a very bad lung function, the condition of a patient will be very bad, which means the muscle functions are bad, uh, which immediately also has an effect of, uh, on, on the, uh, the thoracic uh, cage and um, respiratory function. So these are all interrelated. So as spine surgeons, we need to know what is the normal uh, uh, length of the spine and what is normal growth of the spine at a certain age to keep this into consideration when we are performing surgery or lengthening procedures. Um, and it's not that easy. Uh, skeletal age, of course, is an option. Uh, Risser and Sanders signs are often used, but they are typically uh, uh, around the growth spurt. Uh, many growth charts that we do have, they are actually a mix of female and male patients, which makes them not so precise. Uh, the growth charts also are typically of normal children, not of syndromic patients, which have a different uh, growth profile. And we should always consider the, that the, the presence of spinal deformity basically absorbs the length of the spine. The bigger the scoliosis, the more length is actually lost in the scoliosis itself. So these are the well-known uh, uh, growth charts of uh, Di Maglio on, on the left. He uh, recognized actually three phases of growth, one before five, one between five and 10, and a growth phase uh, at the end of uh, growth during the growth spurt uh, between 10 and 15 years. And he made measurements for different segments of the spine. A similar finding uh, was done by uh, Didi and uh, Yazisi. They measured the uh, length of the uh, thoracic spine on CT scans, and they found a similar uh, profile, although it was a bit more gradual, and they found that the growth spurts seemed to start later, around 12 years old, 
and continued uh, until 16 uh, years old. Uh, during that uh, growth spurt, uh, they measured 1.6 centimeter a year in these uh, uh, kids, which is uh, very much uh, something to consider. Uh, recently, uh, we tried to find out where the growth of the uh, spine is actually coming from. And interestingly, we found that all length gain is from the vertebral bodies. Uh, this is not such a surprise because the uh, growth plate is on the vertebral bodies, but it somehow surprises that the discs remained uh, at five millimeters during uh, growth of the child. So the discs are five millimeters when at birth and they remain uh, that height. Um, if we want to 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 assess growth, uh, there are many different ways. Different ways. Uh, most well known is the uh, the the height of the thorax, which is a unidimensional uh, uh, measurement. Actually, uh, a bit more sophisticated is to measure the uh, so-called freehand length of the spine, uh, which can be done by drawing a uh, harmonic uh, line in the spine. Um, but this measurement is much less uh, used. Um, this makes it important, uh, and this makes it difficult to to compare. Uh, different uh, gui growth guiding techniques um, because so many different measurements are used. Uh, we found in a review uh, paper a few uh, years ago uh, only few papers could be really uh, compared and it's not only the type of measurement in terms of a, a freehand line or the, the T1, T12 height, much more important is um, which uh, period is actually uh, reported on. Um, in this slide, you can see that that um, after inserting a, a an, an implant for growth guidance, uh, there's a lot of height gain. But this height gain is not the result of the growing system; it's the result of the first operation. And then actually, the growth guiding implant is going to do its job, uh, and that is uh, before final surgery, because with final surgery, there's another uh, amount of height gain that cannot be attributed to the uh, uh, guided growth itself. In, a, um, in a, a systematic review and a comparison, we selected the only papers that really reported on this true height gain. And what we found is um, that height gain is actually quite uh, disappointing. Uh, if we look at the whole spine T1S1, which should show at least 1.4 centimeters of growth yearly, uh, with traditional growing rods, uh, only 1.0.6 centimeters was found, and with the MCGR, the magnetic rods that are recently uh, reported on, only one centimeter per year was found when follow-up was more than three years. For the thoracic length, a similar thing was found. The traditional growing road only provided three millimeters per year, which is very little. Uh, with the magnetic rod, this seemed to be a bit, be a bit better at 0.6. And again, the thing stopped. It has something to do with this. Yeah. Um, from this review, we, we, we try to calculate what is actually the, the uh, uh, amount that the growth system is attributing to the, um, to the, to the growth of the uh, uh, child. And we found that if we take all literature together, uh, that uh, less than half of growth gain was the result of the uh, growth guidance implant. Um, 40% was the result of the first implantation and 25% was the result of final fusion. So I think we should be yeah, modest about our expectations of, of the traditional growing rods and magnetic growing rods that we are currently using. Um, also for lung function, uh, this this uh, yeah, modest approach seems to be uh, um, appropriate. Uh, Charlie Johnson investigated in a very nice uh, prospective trial the lung function in 12 uh, patients. Uh, they were all uh, treated at this institution and they completed the growth sparing uh, treatment. 
but in the end, he found that a realistic long-term goal for the management of these uh, patients uh, appears that uh, maintenance of pulmonary function at the level that is not less than the percentage of normal uh, uh, fun uh, pulmonary function uh, at the initial presentation is the highest achievable. In other words, there was no really an improvement of pulmonary function. So the message of this talk is that early onset scoliosis uh, very much impacts trunk development. Uh, obviously, this influences lung function. Uh, it's very hard to determine the exact spinal height uh, and growth. Uh, and this normal spinal growth can definitely not be achieved with the current uh, growth systems. Um, at this moment, there is no optimal uh, treatment modality for uh, early onset scoliosis, and the best achievable goal for the pulmonary function is to maintain it at a decreased level uh, when therapy initiated. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for the uh, problems with the uh, with the um, uh, system. Um, I think the, uh, I, I, we move on to the next presentation. That's by uh, Dr. Kestelijn, also from Utrecht. So, <clears throat> thank you, Moya. I think you um, you should um, shut down your camera because everything is in the way of my presentation now. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Thanks, Mario, for your um, very nice presentation. Uh, I want to thank the organizers, especially Brees and uh, Sunny, also for their uh, work in putting this together. I certainly hope we will be able to meet in person at a point not too far in the future. Uh, my talk is on pulmonary function considerations in early onset scoliosis. Uh -huh. And now I understand Mario's problem because. Hey. Rene, it has to do with uh, when you move that 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 panel, uh, then you I cannot uh, use your buttons anymore. I think I have it uh, in, on the next slide, right? It, it, I think you see my uh, my financial disclosures in this slide. Is that correct? Can someone answer? Am I okay? Yeah, we can see it, uh, Rene. We can see it. Okay, great. Good. Anyway, so since Moya and I are from the same department, but more uh, importantly, since we discuss a little bit the same topic or the same background, you've seen this slide before. Um, this is the normal development that Moya showed, and I think it's important for us all to realize that this magic number of the age of 10, um, at that age, you're still only 50%, 50% of your total adult thoracic volume. So we're in no way out of trouble once we reach the age of 10. So um, I think we have to be aware of that. The other things were said by, by Moya already. So this is about normal development, but how about abnormal development? That is what you see here. This is abnormal development. And of course, none of these rules apply to an abnormal development as occurs in very severe early onset scoliosis. And this slide on the right, the graph, is by the group of Nakamson already in 1992. Pearson was the uh, first author, and they showed that if you have a a severe case of early onset scoliosis, actually infantile scoliosis, that's the older term used for patients between birth and the age of three developing a scoliosis. Then if you have that disease, you're really uh, at risk of dying at an early age because your life expectancy is definitely lower than if you don't have this type of problem. And as mentioned before, the person that I think is one of the big authorities in this field, Greg Redding, he's a pulmonologist, um, he wrote a paper in 2014 where he said that uh, these are the causes of those pulmonary um, uh, function disorders, the loss, loss of long volume and distensibility, but also the loss of uh, chest wall compliance or the flexibility of the chest wall and the reduction of your respiratory strength, the asymmetric lung function and the, uh, the airway compression that is also definitely a part in many more cases of scoliosis than we may previously have thought, and because he's such an expert, he was given the honor to give the um, the Harrington Presidential Guest Lecture for the Scoliosis Research Society this year. 
Um, this is a picture where you see the asymmetry in the 3D image of the of the lungs. And this is from work of one of my former PhD students, who is now a staff member, Tom Schlusser, um, not yet published, but um, he showed that depending on the shape of the thorax and especially the shape of the, the 3D shape of the spine with the apical lordosis, you can have a very severe compression of the uh, bronchial tree. And I think that's something to be aware of. And that's not only in infantile or in, in the early onset types of scoliosis, but also in the older, like the adolescents, this may be a problem. Now, the um, paper that is very often referred to is by Laurie Carroll, and it's often quoted as the Carroll paper also. But I would like you to, to see the name of the second author, Charlie Johnston, who is on that same paper also. And this is a long-term or more or less long-term follow-up of patients treated in an earlier era more or less. They were treated at the end of the 20th uh, century and they were followed up for at least maybe 15, um, uh, no, up to about 15 years, which is a relatively long follow-up for these kind of patients. And what they showed was that the more extensive your thoracic fusion is, the less pulmonary function expressed as the forced vital capacity you, you, you keep, you have. Also, if you fuse up to the higher areas of the thoracic spine, your pulmonary functions as expressed by the force vital capacity decrease also. And this is a very important one that's very often referred to. In order for a pulmonary function to remain around 50%, you would need a certain trunk height. And that trunk height was established in that paper at 18 centimeters. And that's often quoted, we need 18 centimeters at the end of growth Otherwise, your pulmonary function will drop below the 50% margin, or we say it's 20, 20 centimeters perhaps, but that is where that came from. And that's an important paper, um, which had led to many, many devices being introduced to attempt to recreate that thoracic length from T1 to T12 of 18 or perhaps 20 centimeters. But, and this is by Charlie Johnson, and that's why I uh, mentioned his name specifically because he was on that same Laurie Carroll paper and uh, he's, he's an authority uh, on early onset scoliosis as well. He showed me this, these slides and he showed what in his opinion is definitely another reason why these people have impaired uh, pulmonary function because they're intercostals and their diaphragm doesn't work properly. And they also have this spinal penetration, which is something that Jean Dubousset already uh, almost 20 years ago described. And this asymmetry in the thorax is still um, part of your problem, even if you have maybe 18 centimeters of trunk height. So it's not only the height of the trunk that's important for your pulmonary function. And the same Greg Redding in 2014 already said that there were no randomized controls trials that state which surgical strategy or which implant uh, provide the greatest pulmonary or respiratory benefit to the patient. And also important that if we base our strategies on two-dimensional images and we measure cob angles or trunk heights, it doesn't really say very much about respiratory function. And the most important question perhaps is what degree of lung function at the end of adolescence is compatible with a normal adult daily life? So in that sense, before we go into surgery, and I'm sure that Kariman will tell us much more about this, but I think we should keep in mind that the conservative treatment of uh, early onset scoliosis is a very important issue. And here you see an example where in April 2015, there was definitely a scoliosis. And over the years, we've been able, after treatment with what's called the Metacost or the Cotrell cost, I think it's more properly called perhaps, well, perhaps the Cotrell cost, um, we were able to control that curve and probably uh, don't contribute to thoracic stiffening by our surgical procedures and still have more or less of a symmetrical development of the, of the thorax and the, and the lungs. So when we go back to these surgical treatments, there are many papers around and they have a little bit conflicting uh, information. This paper, multi-center paper, um, led by Halali Nordin shows that it measured your uh, uh, forced vital capacity and your first expiratory volume in one second, both functions, both important pulmonary functions, improve between preoperative and postoperative. So this is a very optimistic message. In the use of the magnetic rods, you get an, a significant increase in both FVC and FEV. But there's other papers around, and Moya already showed one of these, 
Um, this is also by Greg Redding that showed that in the Vepter group, uh, a relatively large group of patients studied by the chest wall disorder study group, um, the effect was much more of a stabilizing function of the thorax, but not really improving the respiratory function. And this paper, uh, again by Johnston, also showed that although the uh, absolute values of your FEV and FVC over the years increase because you grow and your, your dimensions increase, the predicted value really doesn't change at all. So the spine elongation and the maintenance of pulmonary function seems to be a realistic goal. But three years after surgery, there's really no change in the predicted percentages of FEV and FVC, so your, um, your important pulmonary functions. And this is also uh, what Greg Redding taught us just uh, very recent, uh, recently in his Harrington lecture, that the um, outcomes, the pulmonary outcomes of the surgery depend very much on the etiology. So in congenital, you don't get really that much improvement, probably also because there's very often rib congenital abnormalities, but especially in idiopathic, you can really make quite a bit of difference. Another thing that I'd like to point to is that um, the, um, the compliance of your chest wall, so the flexibility of your chest wall during breathing is affected by your normal stiffening uh, during growing, during aging, but also the increasing rigidity due to the deformity, but the increasing rigidity as well after the insertion of rigid instrumentations on the spine. And that all leads to the increased respiratory work and all the other problems we see. And I'd like to introduce that, um, that uh, system that we in, in Utrecht have been using, and it's not on the market, so this is really not a commercial talk as far as I'm concerned, but it's, um, it's a way we think that we should deal with these kind of problems maybe a little bit more by applying more flexible implants rather than the very stiff implants that have been used uh, for quite some time. And here you see in a case of a congenital lordosis where there was already at the age of six a beginning of some pulmonary disturbances uh, due to the extreme lordosis and the progressive lordosis where the system was able to really recreate a very important thoracic kyphosis. And here you see um, in a more typical scoliosis what the system can do by just passive expansion of the compressed springs and uh, only occasionally it's necessary to re-tighten those springs but all the time you have a flexible mount you have a flexible anchoring of the system to the spine and to the to the thorax and here you see how the results in the cob angle and also in the um, in the length of the spring uh, improve over time so my conclusions are that early onset scoliosis really impairs lung function depending on etiology, age of onset, trunk height, spinal penetration, chest wall stiffness, and respiratory muscle biomechanics, that growing rod surgery does not predictably improve lung function, but it may prevent progressive decline. Growing rod surgery can worsen thorax stiffening, and we need more flexible systems, and the outcome on lung function differs between different types of scoliosis. So thank you very much for your attention, and I would like now to give the floor to Professor Moram Yazici from Ankara, who will talk on growth-friendly surgical options, the types and principles. Um. Thank you, Rene. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Greetings from Ankara, Turkey. Uh, recent, according to a recent study, Dutch people are usually happier than the Turkish people, but unfortunately, my two predecessors gave very, very pessimistic uh, speech tonight. I'll give more optimistic uh, the talk, and hopefully, we will uh, reach in the, the, some midpoint. My task tonight is to talk about the growth friendly surgical options, types, and principles. First of all, I must say, I must confess, I'm not happy to use the friendly, word of the friendly, because I believe any of uh, the, the spine implant, which can be uh, the usable uh, in the, the early onset years, it, it is not friendly for the spine. But growth sparing or growth preserving techniques, it seems to me more realistic than friendly. But anyway, not, uh, again, is this okay? Nothing to disclose. The classical dogma for early onset scoliosis 
the short but straight spine is better than the crooked one. This uh, suggestion has been done by Bob Winter and Dean McKeven almost 40 years ago. But now, today is 2020. Uh, the, I think we have to do better than the past. If we can have it long and straight, it definitely it will be better. What is the ideal solution for early onset scoliosis? The absolute ideal is going to be a prevention. I mean, like a, the preemptive measures to prevent the deformity before happening, like um, genetic engineering. I probably in our uh, the, uh, the personal life we will not see such a uh, treatment options, but I believe in one day humanity can find some solution for this purpose. But today we are still far from the absolute ideal. We are still talking about near ideal. Near ideal is meaning in my vocabulary, growth preservation as much as possible. But I can uh, classify the growth preservation, not only the surgical technique, but to me it's also the casting is a type of the, uh, the delaying tactic. The, the, the casting, we can delay the surgery, uh, with the growth friendly techniques, we can delay the definitive fusion. But in some cases, in the, the growth, growth friendly or growth preserva preservation techniques is not indicated, and the, the definitive fusion, it's, uh, it's only the option. And then in those cases, we have to, to keep our fusion as minimum as possible. A couple of years ago, David Cax from uh, the LA uh, classified the growth-friendly instrumentation under this three title. This is not classification, maybe grouping, which is a better wording. Let's start with the distraction-based instrumentation. It's the most popular one. I, in my daily practice, I mostly use uh, the growing growth. Growing growth, as a conceptually, is the ideal technique for idiopathic or idiopathic-like deformities, but also, I'll show some case example, if the deform, congenital deformity uh, the, uh, with the, the big compensatory curve, also the growing growth works well. But for the, uh, the good results, the deformity should be flexible, and also in terms of the size, it shouldn't be too severe. And of course, we are talking about the, the young patients younger than age 10. This is the one of the best uh, example, best candidate for growing growth. This is not idiopathic, the syndromic boy, but it's a typical idiopathic-like deformities, a reasonable flexibility. And here is the immediate results and the midterm results. You see deformity is well cor uh, corrected in all three planes. This is the case, is a congenital deformity in the upper thoracic area, but as you see on the screen, the compensatory lumbar curve is bigger than the uh, main curve. And to increase the flexibility, I prefer the concave rib osteotomy in addition to distraction-based instrumentation, immediate results, and the midterm results. You see it's in the both deformities very well controlled, both uh, with the growing growth. Another case is a little bit at the bigger and the, the rigid curves. This is idiopathic, but it's neglected cases over the 10, 90 degrees. Um, and in those cases, I do routinely some uh, additional adjunct at the procedure like concave rib osteotomy or some way of the apical control. In this case, very old case, I prefer to the subluminar wiring, but recently, I prefer uh, the cable or even the, the special design screw to bring the apex, the midline, as much as possible. If you look at the literature, uh, there are many studies uh, the investigating the overall results of uh, the growing growth. According to those papers, even the Moyo criticized those papers in terms of methodology, but uh, the significant uh, amount of growth achievement has been reported. This kind of this height, uh, this amount of the growth even comes from index surgery or um, definitive surgery, but 
from the index to graduation, the, the spine grows very close to the normal values if the, the procedure is being complicated with some infection or some other uh, serious problem. But also there are some bad, uh, the bad news in the literature and we many years ago with the single rod growing rod we reported significant increase of the rotational deformity over the years and also Philly group reported uh, almost uh, 80 per, 90 percent of the patients developed autofusion but the, uh, despite of this complication apical rotation increase or the spontaneous fusion development the overall spinal height it's very close to the normal um, because maybe we can the, the, the spinal fusion the fusion mass is too thin we can easily uh, crack down over the distraction or we can get some growth with the oppositional uh, bony growth How about the pulmonology i mean this paper is already uh, cited uh, by both moyo and rene but they missed to say something about this paper. This is the 12th graduate uh, growing road, but this group is a very heterogeneous group. There, is, there are some congenital or syndromic cases uh, in this group. That's why those patients have another factors to contribute their pulmonary development. But anyway, uh, the TSRH group, uh, the, one of the conclusion of the TSRH group these children are able to keep up with their peers in daily activities and also have the capacity to exercise. Even the, uh, the number of the FBC is less than uh, the normal, but in daily life, they don't have serious problem. The group from China, uh, they analyze their group of the patients with the uh, pulmonary function test and also in their results, um, they didn't see any significant statistical significance with uh, the peers. But our recent study, we just looked only idiopathic, a very homogeneous group, idiopathic early onset scoliosis treated with the growing rod and investigated their pulmonary function. This is a sophisticated test exercise tolerance uh, and also lactate uh, the threshold something like that and finally we found that uh, the both and also we have another group in this study is consisted from the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis which have similar level of the fusion around the thoracic spine if you can compare your tgr graduates with normal it's it's not no um, the surprising things I mean, the overall capacity is less than normal, but if you can compare them with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, I have some good news. The, in terms of exercise tolerance, there is no statistically significant difference between the a a EOS and AIS. I mean, our conclusion from this study, TGR may not uh, make uh, the, our patients pulmonologi pulmonologically normal, fully normal, but TGR converts the EOS to adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, I believe is also a very good uh, the message. Final outcome, what's the final outcome? This is the boy I've shown before, and after the 13 lengthening, no amplan return to OR, her spine looks very symmetric, and her height is exactly the same with, the, with his peers. The girl with congenital spine deformity, 15 lengthening procedure, and final, uh, the thoracic shape, almost normal, and also her functional capacity is pretty normal uh, comparing their peers. This is the another congenital cases. Over the year, we were able to control it to the deformity and the thoracic, thoracic volume grown normally, but at the end of the, the procedure, at the time of the graduation, we did in the asymmetric PSO to get more balanced spine and she is and her family is so happy with the results. And this is the case I really like to share with you. This is the one of my favorite boy 
typical idiopathic uh, early onset scoliosis. Over the years, she developed some adding on deformity. Unfortunately, at the time of the graduation, I needed to extend the instrumentation two levels down, but this is the picture the family sent to me. He is now is the uh, interesting the bodybuilding. If this picture, I believe it's good proof to uh, show his pulmonary, pulmonary capacity and their uh, body uh, situation. Of course, I mean, all these good results, uh, the, the, we, receive, we, we got this good results with the multiple surgeries. Uh, from the paper, from the GSSG, we know that more surgeries, more complications. And the, the case, again, I shown uh, before, uh, the final results looks very optimistic, very reasonable, but to get these results, we had, uh, I believe, 13 or 14 planned and five or six unplanned surgeries, too many surgeries. It's a big burden for both family and patient as well. How about the, psych uh, the effect of the psychology of this repetitive surgeries? This is the first paper in the literature showing uh, the side effect of repetitive surgery over the psychological uh, the status of the patients. We had a study uh, the, uh, the investigating the uh, psychological problems of our growing road patients. I mean, the bad news, depressive symptoms, and the percentage of anxiety is significantly higher than the, uh, their peers. But the good news, and the, over the year, anxiety decreases because they develop some coping skills. And the other problem with the repetitive surgery is this negative effect over the, the brain development. This is one of the hottest topic and it's been discussed over the year in the especially pediatric anesthesiology and pediatric neurology literature. But some of the re recent studies, uh, the uh, finalized and published, and the, of course, there are some problems with their behavior and their learning disability is also common, but you, I mean, all these, and uh, the problems is seen uh, in the patients having the first anesthesia before the age of three. Most of our growing road patients uh, getting the index surgery over the six and seven years, I believe this problem is not big risk for our study group. But now we have a new implant and the magic have the rules of the game has changed. This is the one of the best example for this. This is the boy. I put the, uh, the magic in the event he was five and the three years, all the lengthening was eventful. I changed the road. Another three years, uh, his spine grown normally. I changed the road again. Now is the two more years after this, still two more years for graduation. And over the seven years, he had only three surgeries, one index and two exchange. This is the best example, but the reality is not same for every patient. We had many cases with the collapsing the implant, rod breakage, or infection, because even the magnetically controlled one, the growing rod still growing rod. It's not free, the complication of the general, uh, the problems of the growing rod. Also, uh, the overall complication, unfortunately, is not low than we expected in the past, and 50% unplanned return to OR we reported, and also the recent uh, the Children's Spine Study Group reported a very similar number of the uh, unplanned return after the MCGR. And also MCGR didn't improve the quali health-related quality of life of our patients as we expected, because the, the problem of the social, psychosocial health is not only related to the number of the surgery, it mainly depends on the condition of EOS and the, also the, this situation has been uh, confirmed by the German group and they didn't find any statistical difference between the uh, uh, MCGR and TGR because the most of the problem related to etiology and ambulation ability. Also, 
uh, with the MCHR we have some new problem like metallosis. And the another technique as expansion teratoplasty is mainly the technique it's uh, suggested for chest cage distortion associated with spine deformity, I mean, so-called thoracic insufficiency syndrome. It was very popular 20 years ago. This is the very good candidate for this procedure. With distraction of the, the chest cage, we can get some improvement of the scoliosis, theoretically, and also increase the thoracic height. But and also, this is the uh, spectacular picture. It's been reported by John Ammons. This is the 3D image of thoracic, uh, I mean, pulmonary chest, uh, lung, uh, the volume, and the also how impressive improvement after the chest expansion. But the reality is not the same. And after the vector, uh, the improvement of the pulmonary capacity is not striking as we expected. This is the case, uh, one of my uh, the personal series with the chest expansion. We were equalized the both chest cavity in two uh, dimensional view like this, but over the year she developed a significant crank shafting. As you see here, is the also pulmonary capacity was not good as we hoped. This is the case, and also is a good candidate for this procedure. You see the chest shape; it's been normalized after the chest expansion, but this is the 3D dimensional CT scan. All the spine uh, diffuse over the year, even we didn't touch uh, the spinal column. This is not only our fault, and also this has been reported by the Philadelphia group, autofusion of the spine after the vector expansion. Also, uh, Carol Hassler reported another problem related to vector is the bone formation behind of the uh, bar. Growth guidance is that the originalist uh, technique is being used with the Luki trolley, but not popularized too much. The only the good uh, reports has been reported by Mehdian, but some of the current uh, methods for growth guidance is Sheila, spinal growth harnessing, and the concept needs the apical deformity control by instrumented fusion and self-growing and lengthening system. This is the case of the, the, the Jim McCarthy's cases. As you see, uh, the apical vertebral uh, deformity controlled by the fusion and the screws. And then with the sliding rod, we are expecting the self-growth of the spine. But over the years, and the, in those cases, we see some rotational increase contrary to our previous belief and also according to Lindsay Aldras and the Davis Cax uh, studies uh, growing growth has a greater increase of T1S1 height and the Sheila unfortunately is not really uh, harnessing the growth as we're expecting. I use this technique little bit modification in the uh, cerebral palsy or syndromic patient which are not suitable for repetitive surgery. This is the case, the deformity is self-control with the, uh, sliding the screws. This is a new technique, is compression-based instrumentation, vertebral body tether. It is the good option for juvenile idiopathic scoliosis, but if you use the technique in the early ages, there is a high risk for recurrence deformity or uh, overcorrection. Today, it's not good in the case, it's not good case, uh, technique for early onset scoliosis. How about the definitive fusion? In some cases, especially over the age of 10, maybe we can consider the definitive fusion to uh, overcome the all complication of the growing growth, but we shouldn't forget, even we fuse the spine from top to bottom, still there is risk for some risk for crankshafting. As a conclusion, growing growth is a delaying tactic for spinal fusion we can get near normal spinal growth and thoracic development. MCGR opens a new chapter, reduce the number of the surgeries, but still not an ideal solution. Expansion teratoplasty, mainly for, as a chest cage implant and good for congenital scoliosis with refusion. Sheila, yes, is a less surgery, but not one surgery 
you know, only less growth and insufficient control of the apical rotation. Now, VBT, I believe it's not good for EOS, and we can consider the definitive fusion in the patients older than 10 years of age. Now I'm stopping here and giving this stage to Sebastian Pesanti to speak about uh, complications. Okay, so thank you. I hope uh, everyone is able to see my screen. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present about the complications in uh, uh, early onset scoliosis surgery. I'm uh, Sébastien Pesanti. I have the chance to work in uh, Marseille, France, with uh, uh, the uh, Professor Jean-Luc Jouve. So by looking at the EOS classification, you can easily understand that these patients are particularly at risk of complications in terms of etiology, congenital neuromuscular or syndromic scoliosis usually occurs in patients with poor nutritional status. Then these young patients often present with big spinal deformity with a chance of respiratory impairment. And finally, Spinal deformity with changes in the trajectory profile will, will have more chance to lead to mechanical complications. All these parameters lead to a certain degree of frailty in these patients associated to a high risk of complication that could be general complication, implant related, one related, or alignment complications. So when looking at the literature, complication rate is indeed quite high, almost 60% with more than one complication per patient in average. The rate of complication is closely related to the number of procedures. A patient undergoing seven procedures, including lengthenings, has a 49% chance of experiencing a complication. And this risk goes up to 80% when the number of procedures reaches 11. Consequently, it has been reported that there was a plus 24% chance of complication for each additional procedure. But despite the high compli complication rate, you must keep in mind that natural history of EOS is worse with respiratory insufficiency, impaired spinal and chest growth, and eventually shorter life expectancy. So in uh, uh, big curves in uh, uh, early onset uh, scoliosis, surgeons and families should balance the risk of complication versus long-term benefits of surgical treatments. So now let's see in detail the different complications. First of all, you have the skin-related complications. They are quite frequent because of multiple surgeries performed through the same incision site, impaired nutritional status in these patients with poor soft tissue quality. Implant prominence can be a problem in younger children uh, uh, because it's a ma major driver of skin-related issues. In order to decrease the incidence of such complications, it's recommended to place the rods into the muscles, as patients with subcutaneous rods have been proven to experience more and plan return to the OR. Infections in these patients are directly related to skin problems. It occurs in about 15% of the cases and can have uh, dramatic consequences as uh, it can stop or postpone the lengthening procedures. So how to manage them? The best advice to give you is uh, uh, don't hesitate to use aggressive strategies. Indeed, you must do your best in order to avoid hardware exposure, and if so, early return to the OR is mandatory for wound closure. The use of skin muscle of, or, or the use of skin or muscle flaps is of major interest if you feel you don't have enough soft tissue coverage. Infections should be managed aggressively as well because of their dramatic consequences. And with early surgical debridement and intravenous antibiotic therapy, it's possible to heal patients from infections. Rod removal is, uh, should be the last, the last resort as it, it's a no return point. The use of nasal swab could be useful for identification of at-risk patients, but the benefit of infection remains unclear. Finally, man magnetically controlled growing rods may reduce the risk of infection as it allows to decrease the number of procedures per patient by two. But to date, no clear data about the decreased risk of infection is available when using such device. Let's move on to the implant-related complications. They are the most frequent complication in these patients with a reported 70% rate of, uh, of uh, implant of, uh, rod fracture. 
Among them, rod fracture occur in 15% of the cases and uh, with uh, the uh, strong risk factors being previous history of rod fracture, ambulatory status uh, that increases the loading on the roads, single rod constructs, and large deformities. Rod fractures usually occur near, next to the anchors, next to the tandem connectors, or at the Torah Colomba uh, junction because of increased mechanical stress at these sites. So how to manage them? If asymptomatic, no unplanned surgery is needed. You can just wait for the next lengthening procedure to change the road. Note that this is obviously not true for uh, MCGR, where the road fracture will lead to unplanned surgery uh, in order to uh, change the roads. Another important point is that in dual road construct, remind changing both roads even if only one is broken. Indeed, the risk of experiencing a new road fracture is higher when one road is left in place, probably due to the accumulation of mechanical stress at, uh, uh, on the uh, left road. Once again, all the complications are entangled with trousers, and it's not unusual to face skin problems associated with road fracture or uncaused dislodgements. In order to minimize the risk, you will have to choose the maximum rod diameter, dual rod construct instead of single rod construct, and beware of the sagittal contour as it's probably one of the main driver of mechanical overstress of the construct. Anchors migration is also a frequent complication. According to the series, it occurs in 15 to 50% of the cases and represents more than 70% of the implant-related complications. It mainly concerns proximal anchors, and it's easily understandable because UIVs and LIVs should be able to carry both the weight of the patient and the distraction forces. Therefore, it's recommended to have at least five proximal anchors in order to decrease the risk of dislodgement. Please note that there is no difference in terms of dislodgement, whether the anchors are spine-based or rib-based. Management of anchor dislodgement is often very tricky because at these levels, you often have to face fracture of the lamina or big fusion mass without any anatomical landmark. You have to consider changing anchor type or even changing anchor level if you're not able to uh, uh, put anchors or pedicle screw at the, at the uh, initial levels. In some cases, the use of city guided technology can be very helpful uh, in order to find uh, your way to the pedicle. Concerning the alignment complications, you have to keep in mind that the main objective in this surgery is to obtain at the end a proper coronal and sagittal alignment. In the coronal plane, all the correction you can get will be obtained during the first surgery. The following lengthening uh, procedures are only meant to maintain initial uh, correction and uh, to follow child growth. If you want to uh, avoid adding on phenomenon, uh, you also have to keep in mind that you uh, don't want to spare level and uh, uh, your, instrument, your instrumentation should be long enough. Now, concerning the sagittal malalignment that is quite frequent in uh, EO surgeries, when looking at these charts, you can see that uh, there is a decrease on, uh, of thoracic kyphosis after the initial surgery, and that is concomitant to a decrease of lumbar lordosis, and TK will uh, subsequently increase, but probably due to the occurrence of a PGK. Most of the authors report decrease in uh, thoracic kyphosis and lumbar lordosis, meaning that growing rods have the consequence of flattening the spine. This phenomenon is accompanied by a global alignment becoming more posterior with a decreased SVA and an increase in pelvic tilt. This could be one of the reasons for the uh, frequency of PGK in these patients. Talking about PGK, the rate is uh, still unclear in uh, EOS patients, but most of the authors report a rate around 25 to 30%. As a reminder, PJK occurs in about 20% of the cases in AAS patients. Despite what is reported by some authors, the rates of PJK seems to be identical between the MCGR and the uh, traditional uh, growing rows. Many risk factors have been uh, reported, uh, the same than uh, in uh, AAS patients, but the, the strongest seem to be uh, the UIV below T2, uh, LIV above L4, and an overcorrection of a preoperative hyperkyphosis. 
Concerning the neural complication, they are quite unusual in EO surgery and they are reported to occur in less than 5% of the cases. There are mainly three causes of uh, neurologic deficits. First, uh, you can have an over distraction during the initial surgery that can be easily prevented by the use of neuromonitoring intraoperatively. Second, it can be tricky to place uh, pedicle screws in these patients with frequent abnormal anatomy. So uh, if so, you, can, uh, uh, you should consider using alternative anchors to the spine, such as uh, hooks or, or bends. And finally, some screw pullout during distraction procedures have been described and can be prevented by the use of a sufficient amount of anchors at, at a rod uh, foundation. So last but not least, the uh, um, you know, complications in a v VEPTR that suffers the same complications than traditional growing words, but it presents some specific complications such as uh, brachial plexus injuries. And in order to avoid it, rib cradles should be placed, uh, uh, should not be placed too cranial or too lateral and the boundary being in the skull and muscle that should not be crossed. You know, in some cases, uh, you can have a scapular scarring uh, that have been described and should be addressed during lengthening procedures. So in conclusion, surgery in EOS patients is associated with a high complication rate. Surgeons and families should be aware of the risk, but don't forget that natural history of EOS could be uh, much more worse. Management of skin-based complication uh, involves nutritional status management and should be aggressive with early return to the OR and the use of skin of muscle or muscle flaps. Management of implant related complications uh, goes to uh, uh, the prevention of, uh, of uh, dislodgement uh, with at least five anchors uh, at the proximal foundation, the use of dual rod and uh, the maximum rod diameter and alignment complication and PJKs that uh, have been reported to occur in 30% of the cases don't try to overcorrect hyperkyphosis and don't try to spare vertebral levels because uh, according to literature, the minimum instrumentation in order to be safe regarding alignment complications is from T2 to L4. I uh, uh, voluntarily did not uh, uh, speak about the other techniques such as uh, stapling or anterior, body, anterior vertebral body tethering because of the paucity of data uh, in uh, EOS patients. So thank you for your attention. So let me now introduce Dr. Karimana Belin-Genevois, who's going to give a talk about uh, conservative treatment. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, joining us today for this uh, EPOS webinar. I, I have the, the chance today to, to talk uh, about uh, uh, the conservative options, which uh, have been not forgotten, but uh, somehow uh, um, not discussed before. Uh, so what are the conservative options for early onset scoliosis? When we are talking about that, uh, we should first know that spinal growth velocity is very important to understand in order to know what we are going to do with this conservative treatment. The fastest rate of growth is the first year of life, almost twice the, the mean annual gain height uh, that we see in adolescents. Then we have a, a slight um, a change in, in this uh, velocity, and we are going to reach the velocity of adolescent uh, growth spurt. Then we will have a cruise period between 4 and 10, uh, where the, the gain height will be uh, about 5 to 6 centimeters a year. Uh, 5 to 6 centimeters, sorry. So you see that we have a reversible area, and then we have another area that is more appropriate for stabilization. The, the goal of EOS is to correct as soon as possible the 3D deformity, but it is also to save somehow respiratory function. We know that early onset scoliosis interferes with the normal growth of the trunk, and this will be responsible for short trunk difficulties to breathe under development of thoracic cage. Conservative options are uh, only benefits to, to, to me because it is a growth-friendly technique and here we can use it. Um, a few uh, and uh, minor complications are seen uh, using these uh, techniques. There is a rapid learning curve and you're very welcome to, to come to Lyon if you, you want to, to discuss this and learn about it as we use it quite often. 
and it has a positive effect on trunk height and pulmonary function. So the only risk that we are facing is the progression that will open a discussion for the surgical options that we have seen. So what is a valuable conservative option? Any efficient and non-surgical option to solve scoliosis or at least to stop the progression. Uh, casting, bracing are the different options. The principles of casting learned from uh, uh, Cotrel for us uh, is the, the principle of the EDF technique, elongation, derotation, flexion. It is a 3D passive correction of the structural curve uh, with an active correction that will be done by the patient escaping the forces of correction. Sequential and progressive correction of the deformity is very similar to the Ponsetti cast that we do for uh, crab fruits and discs and soft tissues will gradually release as we have learned from Jean Dubousset. Here you have the case of a four-year-old idiopathic early onset scoliosis. You see this double curve with a major thoracal number one. The cast can be done under general anesthesia, but it can also be done under simple sedation. First, we uh, perform an MRI in order to uh, eliminate red flags and to uh, confirm it is an idiopathic one and uh, to make sure that we don't need uh, neuromonitoring to perform this first correction. So we have this careful elongation by suspension that will gradually uh, uh, help to correct the patient and stabilize him. Then we have the sagittal correction that we can start to do by uh, uh, first this head flexion that will get the thoracic kyphosis correction and the lumbar lordosis also will be controlled by the hip and knee flexion or extension depending on what we want to, to get. The second step is the apical derotation. We will apply vertical bands uh, that are placed to derotate the spine from the apex and uh, posterior lateral forces will be applied. A uh, three-point correction with counter bands that we can have under arm or uh, in the lumbar apex can also help to correct double or triple curves. The third step is the application of circle, circular cast and it is accompanied by this uh, molding by transverse derotation from the anterior lateral side of the apex and this will help uh, to guide uh, the volume redistribution. A large window is created on the anterior lateral side of the apex in order to avoid uh, space uh, to, to take space from, from the lungs, sorry, and this is absolutely crucial to uh, avoid a lung restriction. And additional corrections can also be done by adding these pads that you see under the cast that can be added 15 days after, uh, depending on the patient's inner flexibility. And uh, the ideal pace to add correction is about 15 days for us and uh, the, the pace for repeating casting is one or two months later. So here you have the four serial casting of six weeks that this patient went through with an almost perfect correction and the patient can now uh, start with nighttime uh, hypercorrection brace or a uh, simple brace in order to keep uh, the correction and uh, it will allow a maximum compliance. In 2005, Mehta conducted a prospective study on the role of casting in infantile scoliosis, and this is a, a quite homogeneous series. She reported a series of 136 children that were treated with serial plaster casts, and she showed how uh, we could have a complete resolution of the deformity in young children aged four years or less, um, especially those with moderate curves, 25, 30 degrees, and reduction in the magnitude of severe cur curvatures, averaging 50 degrees and in older children, were at least reduced and maintained. The rate of surgery in this, sur in this series, with a, a long term, was uh, 35%. Uh, um, Sanders uh, showed comparable results to Mehta with the full correction of even bigger infantile curves. Curves less than 60 degrees were resolved when treated before 20 months of age and uh, casting in older children, uh, larger curves or non-idiopathic could even improve in most of these kids. 
Here you have a table from uh, Canave's state-of-the-art review that you can find uh, in, uh, uh, as a PDF on internet quite easily. It reports the outcome of EOS treated with serial casting, confirming the efficacy of uh, this to control those curves with a, a mean delay in surgery of 2.5 years. Um, META perspective series was uh, five, uh, at, at least eight years uh, delay for, for, for surgery, which is uh, quite interesting for this case. And the mean rate of surgery was about 35% in the whole series, similar to the findings of uh, the perspective series of META. So casting allows a, a serial progressive correction of the deformity using the child's intrinsic reducibility and is uh, stronger uh, than brace treatment in its efficiency and it enhances in-brace correction and can also completely resolve an infantile idiopathic scoliosis before uh, the age of uh, uh, three or four. Casting is a low risk, high efficiency option. We have low rate of complications reported. We have a rapid learning curve. We have positive effects on tramp heights and we have no negative effects on respiratory function. Casting for EOS has some prognostic factors. We saw that age of treatment onset could either um, um, make the curve cure or not, or just uh, uh, maintain. Uh, the type of curve, single curves are easier to treat than double. The etiology, idiopathic are easier than syndromic. And um, I invite you also to read the paper from Amin Mehta about uh, the, the rib vertebral angle, because this is quite crucial when you have an angle more than 20 degrees, you will have less response. The cob angle at the end of casting, more than 10 degrees, had also higher risks of non-resolving. So, when to decide brace treatment for EOS, I would say that casting is a gold standard for EOS conservative management. Bracing is ideal to maintain the final result of serial casting. There are some prognostic factors that will help to decide if bracing uh, only is possible or not. The remaining growth, I think juvenile are more uh, into this kind of attitude than infantile. The etiology, idiopathic more than syndromic the location and magnitude of the deformity, but also its flexibility or embrace correction. The consensus recommendation for bracing are the ones published by Richards uh, uh, from the SRS, curve magnitudes between 25 and 40 degrees, open three radiate cartilage includes the juvenile ones, and uh, we have to brace these patients until skeletal maturity is reached. The ideal brace should be light, comfortable, pain-free, it shouldn't restrict the thoracic cage, and it should be efficient. Efficient means that in-brace correction should be optimal, but it means also that it should be optimal in terms of compliance, so part-time treatments are much better for this key. The principles of bracing are quite the same as casting, but less efficient. We apply external passive forces to the trunk to reverse asymmetrical constraints during the skeletal growth. And again, we work on soft tissues, but um, the, the role of serial casting is more on the soft tissue thing, and that's probably the difference why, why it is uh, more efficient. Bracing results, we don't have many uh, studies. Few studies looked at real early onset scoliosis. We have the paper from uh, the team of uh, Brice and from Kevin Mazda, who uh, was uh, the uh, the innovator of this detorsion nighttime bracing system that was applied first to, to juvenile and adolescent scoliosis. Uh, here uh, they published their series on these early onset scoliosis, 33 patients that had a, a mean cob angle of 31 degrees and 45% of the series reached skeletal maturity. And you can see that the success rate is quite high, 67% with when the treatment is efficient, a mean cup correction of 15 degrees. So this hypercorrection nighttime brace is clearly a good option for these kids. It's hypercorrective, so it will have a real action on growth. Um, nighttime uh, bracing is, will allow a very good compliance. It will be well tolerated despite the position of the kid. 
it can act both on coronal and sagittal pen and uh, we, we can uh, also apply it uh, for uh, juvenile AOS. The cons are uh, patients who have not single curves. It is good for lumbar and thoracolumbar, but less efficient for thoracic ones. Again, the, the revertebral angle is not modified and uh, it is also addressed to mild curves and flexible curves, meaning that casting is still the best option. Other series have uh, shown uh, the, efficacy, the efficacy of a new bracing technique using CAD-CAM design braces that are very close to the way we are performing the EDF casting. And you see that the success rate in this preliminary uh, publication is 75%, but only at 12 months with a significant in-brace correction. And the second publication, the most recent, showed that nine of these patients at two-year follow-up had a, a, a good to excellent results. But it is clear to everyone that the, the real impact of bracing is when you add casting and bracing in order to uh, maintain these patients in the lowest rates of uh, uh, deformity. So as a take-home message, I would say that CAS treatment is a valuable delaying tactique for younger children with early onset scoliosis. The spine deformity is adequately controlled in these braces. The growth still goes on. Surgical complications associated with early uh, growing broad techniques are avoided or delayed. And uh, we, we have uh, also excellent results with casting that can cure EOS before the age of 2.5 years or uh, it can also delay and avoid surgery after three years. The ideal patients are non-syndromic EOS with curves between 30 and 50 degrees. And I should add even uh, the uh, MEFA uh, rib vertebral angle of uh, less than 20 degrees or 30 degrees in order to get the best uh, uh, correction. Many thanks. These are some of uh, the literature uh, papers that you should read absolutely. And now I invite Chris to make the final conclusions uh, of this webinar. And I invite you to ask questions if you have any. Thank you very much, uh, Carrie Mann. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm very sorry we're, we're running a little bit late, but uh, all these talks were very interesting. And I really want to thank the faculty for their great job and for all the time they spent on this preparation because I know it's hard to make very short talks on such an exciting subject. So I will try to summarize and give you a very short conclusion and some give you some thing hope messages. And once again, since I think that my introduction was a little bit cut and or I wasn't live at the beginning, I really want to thank uh, the Society of Orthopediatrics, uh, which helped uh, EPOS organize this fourth uh, webinar on spine. So I think the conclusion of our talks is that we really need to think conservative first, always. And specifically, if the cause of the scoliosis is not congenital. The main goal of our conservative treatment should always be to reduce or stop the progression, and of course, maintain the spine flexibility for future final treatment. And sometimes also, the conservative treatment helps the doctor who's taking care of the kid to evaluate the caretaker's compliance, but also the motivation for future treatments. So as um, Kariman said, in our team, we like to wait with the detorsion night brace. And I just mentioned it, Kariman already mentioned the results, but it's interesting to see that this night brace is uh, often used in AIS, but uh, fewer people use it in early onset scoliosis. And we tend to use it after the age of three, and we have pretty good results. Of course, they're not perfect, but they're a good way also to wait. Uh, and usually you have a great compliance with this brace, which is something uh, very interesting for us. I usually consider surgery mostly for non-idiopathic cases. And in my current practice, it's mostly between six-year-old and nine-year-olds, because when kids are older than nine, I truly believe, like Mohari mentioned as well, that we're not so far from fusion, I try to avoid surgery. My, always, my goal is always to avoid surgery in, in such kids at the beginning. So usually I consider surgery for big cub angles greater than 60 degrees, 
mostly if it's progressive, of course, despite a conservative treatment, and more and more if it's getting stiffer. And this is also, of course, uh, the best solution when patients are not compliant with BRACE. But of course, you need, and that's very important, to have comprehensive caregivers, because this is a long way to manage until a skeletal maturity. One thing which I think is important is, as you saw in this uh, presentation, that we have many and many options. But I think you're not treating a curve, you're treating a patient. And we have specific solution for each patient. This is just two examples that I chose, because you'll see that the curve to treat is pretty similar. But in that case, I had this kid uh, who had an early onset scoliosis, which was progressive despite a, a good compliance to my tr brace treatment. But this patient was a Jehovah Witness, so we really wanted to postpone the surgery and try to avoid it. That's why I didn't consider any growing rod or anything else. So we just waited with the night brace. We tried to keep the spine flexible, and she finally had a pretty good result, at least radiologically, uh, with the final fusion, which was started and initiated by uh, four weeks of hologravity traction. On the other hand, if you look at this other kid, who was 9.5 year old, she had a very poor brace compliance. The curve was getting stiffer. And when I saw her, she was only one meter, 35 centimeter, while she had a very extremely high uh, and tall dad and mother. That's why in her age, I didn't want to consider final fusion at one meter, 35 centimeter. And we decided to go to growing rods. So, I, and, but if you look at both curves before the, the, the final surgery, they were pretty similar. So I think, once again, every early onset scoliosis kid has a specific solution and the best to find with the caretaker. So I think the main take home message from my part is that surgery is never benign. And I really appreciated the, the term that uh, Muharram used, surgery is never friendly. So we have to take care of, and of all these growth friendly techniques, so-called, because as uh, we have many complications, as uh, Sebastian said, and I think we always need to think of the future fusion, because any surgery always makes your future fusion more difficult. As it was showed by Rene and Moyo, the chest volume is not exactly correlated with pulmonary function, and that's something we need to keep on working on, I think, to evaluate and compare our different surgical options. And I still think that we have insufficient data on quality of life. And I strongly recommend you to use the EOS Q24 questionnaire, which is very helpful and make probably will probably make our results comparable in the future. And I think that also, as uh, Sebastian mentioned in his first slide, we really need to distinguish the different etiology to evaluate the outcomes because the syndromic are very different from the idiopathic cases. So I strongly recommend you as well to use this uh, easy to remember and easy to use classification, which was developed by uh, many authors, including Muharrem. And uh, because if we want to compare all our techniques, I think we need to classify the curves the same way and also evaluate the quality of life the same way, because this is the final outcome. The final outcome should always be the quality of life of our patients. So thank you very much for attending this webinar. I think we have, maybe I will uh, ask the faculty to come back on screen um, with the rest of us. And we only have time for one question because we are a bit late. And uh, this question is actually for uh, Kariman. And maybe the other authors can also give their advice on that. So the question was, uh, Kariman, when you do a cast specifically under general anesthesia, uh, do you use neuromonitoring? And I think I would like to have uh, all the faculties uh, point on this one. And also the question could be also asked when you do a growing rod, do you necessarily need to have neuromonitoring when you do growing rod or you don't use it? So please, uh, maybe Kariman, uh, tell your answer first and maybe all the rest of the faculty could do as well. Well, for uh, growing rods, for sure, I use neuromonitoring, monitoring, uh, even when uh, lengthening, because patients are under general anesthesia and you, you don't control exactly what you do. As Sebastian said, uh, we, we want to have maximum correction, so we are going to be strong on our distraction. Uh, so if it's a surgical distraction, yes. And for bracing, when patients um, come the first time, they have under general anesthesia when they're young, an MRI, and then they go directly to the, the cultural frame and they, they go for the bracing, for the casting. 
um, if uh, there is any abnormality, we always do in these kids like uh, syringomyelia, we always do neuromonitoring during the, the casting. Okay. And uh, uh, Renee, what do you do? Um, basically, exactly the same as Kariman just said. So that's the shortest answer. So neuromonitoring for all the growing rods and for all the casts? No. Uh, <laughs> No, we have the MRI, but we do the uh, neuromonitoring for the growing rods, and if the MRI is normal, not for the casting. Okay, and uh, uh, Sebastian? Yeah, uh, the the I think the I, I totally agree with uh, uh, with the the faculty that uh, it's uh, uh, really necessary to have neuromonitoring during uh, surgical procedures. For the cast, uh, you need uh, general anesthesia for younger kids. And we know that under the, the age of four, neuromonitoring is not really reliable. So it's quite difficult to have a, a good uh, curves uh, with uh, neuromonitoring. And it, it's uh, quite difficult to do the cast under general anesthesia, plus the, all the cables you need for, for the neuromonitoring. So we, I think the best answer for that is uh, to try to uh, uh, use the less as possible uh, uh, general anesthesia for the cast, and we're doing that more in, in a younger and, and younger kids uh, in a, in a Marseille, and it, it works quite well if uh, you have the, all the, the caregivers that are aware of uh, doing cast in uh, young children uh, without general anesthesia. Okay. Do you have anything to add, Muharrem? Yeah. Usually, I don't agree with the karma, as usually we are just mad agreeing. Anyway. Uh, sorry, just a joke. Uh, the, I do differently. First of all, um, the, I stopped to use the general anesthesia for casting. I'm using ketamine uh, instead of GA. And most of our patients and the casting patients is younger than three. And I'm still worried about the, uh, apply the GA for such a young uh, children because of uh, the behavioral difficulties or developmental delay. This is one reason. And also, ketamine gives me isn't the same flexibility. I feel more comfortable as the GA. It's easy and practical. And then also, it's good to monitor uh, their leg and upper extremity. It looks like a very practical. Regarding the growing rod, I always use the growing uh, the nerve monitoring at the index surgery. But if we don't have any signal changes, a signal alert during the index surgery, I don't use the lengthening procedure. I mean, mostly I prefer the magic as much as possible. We don't need to uh, use the monitoring, but even the TGR, if the first surgery and index surgery went eventfully, I don't use it because the neuromonitoring preparation, it takes almost half an hour or 45 minutes. And the lengthening, simple lengthening is also less than uh, this uh, amount of uh, the time. That's why you can easily uh, wake up the patients, you can see, you can check. And luckily, I don't have any uh, serious uh, effects with this uh, policy. Thank you, Maren. Moyo, do you have uh, something different to say? No, I'm working together with uh, Rene. So we have the, the only thing I have to add is that occasionally we have patients that are quadriplegic or have uh, severe muscular conditions, and then neuromuscular uh, neuromonitoring is not such an uh, added value. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions, but uh, thank you very much to uh, all the faculty and the attendants. Uh, thank you for your great talks and your time and. Uh, Hopefully, we'll meet very soon at EPOS or anywhere else. We'll see. But uh, we can wait for that. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.